This is the Dreamers Podcast, where dreamers share their stories to inspire you. Now, join host Joe Pardo as he interviews a dreamer who's living their dreams. the show, Catherine. Thank you. If you would, please give uh, some background to our listeners. Well, I was a high school educator for 27 years, 25 of them, a little over 25 of them here in New Jersey. I started my teaching career actually in the city of Philadelphia. And before that, I was a full-time college student, of course, in Westchester, uh, at Westchester University. And I did a lot of acting and performing when I was in high school and college. And then I got away from it for quite a while and devoted myself to my teaching, which I really enjoyed. I was an English teacher. Uh, That was the subject uh, for which I had the most passion, having been involved in theater. So I did get a chance to teach plays and literature. And I ran a public speaking and debate program at the high school for a little over 25 years. And it, it was a great career. And then the district in which I taught was growing larger. And I mean, 27 years is a long time to be doing anything. So I I felt really the need to kind of change. I did not want to become an administrator. A lot of teachers go into administration or they go into guidance counseling. They teach for maybe 10, 15, 20 years, then they move up the ladder. I had no interest in doing either one of those things. And I had actually started to assistant play direct um, at the high school for about eight years. And that's what got me thinking about acting again, because I would be directing these kids with a co-director and I would see them up on stage. And I think to myself, I would just love, I mean, I I enjoy directing, but I would love to get back up there again. Like I want to be where they are. And (laughs) and I kept saying that to myself in my head. I'm like, oh man, I would just, I would just love to get back up on the stage again. So I knew when I retired, that's what I wanted to do. Wow. Yeah. That's fantastic that you were able to, uh, want to not just have the want but the ability to get back up on on stage uh what uh before we get into that part what what exactly inspires you um a a lot of things i think that one of the things that i was very fortunate to have um my parents in growing up they my mother used to always say you can do anything you put your mind to (laughs) <laughs> so um that's when she wanted to try to push you you know to do to do your best but I, I i guess my inspiration would have been my father who kind of knew that i had the ability to speak and perform and he nurtured that he got me involved in activities when i was a kid that where i could use my voice because i really did have and I had a proclivity for a good speaking ability from the time I was very young. Actually, when I was about six years old, I did a radio commercial with my dad. Uh, I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, and we belonged to a large parish there. And they had a big church carnival every year. It was a big, big deal um, in the city. And uh, they were going to invest some money in doing some advertising on radio. And my dad was a good speaker and my father was on this committee and he's like, Oh, my daughter would do this. And I remember being six years old and just had no fear of doing it at all. Um, and my grandmother who's still living, who's 97 was also wow. an inspiration. She used to read stories to us when we were kids and she would do all the voices, you know, she was, and she also performed on stage. You know, she did some acting when she was younger, back in the 1930s and early 1940s. So a long time ago. <laughs> right. So um, she would, you know, march me up and down that neighborhood in West Philly, and I'd recite nursery rhymes. And <laughs> for people up and down the neighborhood, she just would be so delighted with that. So I guess those were people that kind of inspired me um, because they believed in me, and they believed I had a, a talent and an ability, and they fostered that. And when, when other people believe in you, you believe in yourself. Yeah, I, I can't it, echo that enough. Yeah, absolutely. It yeah. definitely makes a difference no mm-hmm. matter what you're trying to accomplish. And even just um, having, uh, you said, was it your mom or your your dad that mm-hmm. said that, you know, you could be anything you wanted to be? Right. Or was it your... My mom had said mom, that, right. yes. <laughs> but they both believed it. Well, my grandfather and my grandmother were very big, uh, were very big on that idea. Yep. 
So how how did your dream come about? I mean, you kind of touched on it um, growing up. Right. What, what what was it that really uh, sparked it? Well, post retirement, now I retired from high school teaching. I was forty nine. Took a very early retirement. I mean, I started teaching at twenty two. I was barely, you know, a couple <laughs> years older than some of the people I was teaching. But I did take an early retirement, and when I was talking about um, retiring and notifying my family that I was, and I was very fortunate because I have a husband who's very supportive, and we we had made some good decisions financially throughout our marriage, and we had two kids to send to college, and our daughter was still was still in college, and our son had yet to go, but um, we've always lived below our means, and we always budgeted very carefully, so we we knew we could do this. You know, my husband does well, so we knew we could do it, but. Um, I was talking about it with my brother, and my brother is directs professionally. He's a theater guy, and he's always been involved in shows and productions through the area. He's done some theater in Philadelphia. He has a very close relationship with a community called the Arden a Theater. It's in Wilmington, Delaware. It's a community of artists. Oh, okay. And it's very, not to be confused. There's also an Arden Theater in Philadelphia. Yeah, I've been to the one in Philly. Right, but he's associated with the one in Wilmington. It's actually an arts community. And actually, are they related? They're they're not. They're I don't not, think oh, they just. I don't think they are. Unfortunately, I, have the I might same be name. mistaken on that, but I'm not sure. But um, he's actually in a production of Henry II over there right now. He's in rehearsal for that, and I'm in rehearsal for a show in the city. But anyway, um, I was talking to him. And I said, you know, I'm retiring and I want to get back to doing the things I love. And he was involved in a pre- – he was getting ready to direct a production of Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. I remember, he, I remember you posting about mm-hmm. that. And he wanted me to be involved in it. So he basically offered me the role in it. And uh, I also sing. I've always sung. I did musicals in high school and that kind of thing. And actually this was a singing role. So he cast me in this role and that was the first show I did. And it was really wonderful because he's five years younger than I. And we both did theater at Slazy Adam High School, but we could never, we were never in shows together because we were never in the high school together because we were five years years. apart, right? right. right, right. So I did theater and then I graduated and then he went to Slazy Adam and he did theater there and I would go and support him. And then I did theater at Westchester. He went to Westchester University as well. But again, we never worked together. We knew the same directors. We worked with the same people, um, but we never could do anything together because we were five years apart. Uh, So this was the first time that we were working together and it was so wonderful um, because he's, he's really a wonderful director and it was just, just a joy to, it was just such a, like what a thrill, like to retire from one thing. And then the first thing you do after retirement is work with, you know, your brother, your, your baby (laughs) brother is now directing you in this play. And it was a great, great experience. And what was interesting is our father um, passed away. It'll be 25 years in October. Um, our father died very young, unfortunately. And that show <clears throat> closed on October 1st, which is our dad's birthday, which was <sighs> really interesting that that, <laughs> that, that, it, that it worked out that way. Um, and uh, so we were like, yeah, somebody's looking out for us up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was my first in taste in getting back to it. Yeah, well, I mean, everything was, happens for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep. How was your dream received by your family members and other people in your life? That, like, hey, I'm retiring. Right. Now I'm going to go act. Right, and I'm going to go do this stuff. Um, I, uh, you know, it was interesting because I can do as much or as little theater as I want. I don't have to do it professionally. Actually, the next three shows that I'm doing, the production I'm doing now and the next two, I do get a little stipend for it because oh. it's with a professional theater company in Philadelphia. But I've also done community theater over the past three years. And uh, I, I'll, I'll do any worthwhile project, whether I get paid for it or not. And I had the luxury of being able to do that. But it is a, a large time commitment. And it's time away from your family. And it's time away from my husband. And my family has been very, very supportive. Um, when they can, they come out to see the shows, uh, which is great. My husband sees everything I'm in. Uh, My kids just depends. Um, My daughter um, graduated two years ago from LaSalle University. So, and she's got a job right now. She's an executive director of a company and she works six days a week and she's very busy. And our son just finished his second year at Villanova. So he's across the bridge. And, you know, when, when, if if he's home, uh, the last show I did called The Pearl, which was written by a local Philadelphia playwright. It was a great, great little play. Um, he was home for spring break, so he was able to see that. When you talk about your family being supportive, it's interesting. Because this last show that I did, I had to um, 
kiss a man on stage. And I mean, like <laughs> real, like get into it. Like it was like, and three or four times I had to do. And I, so I, you know, I, I talked it over with my husband and I said, now, you know, this is, and it's, but my son having to see me do that, you know? And at first he was like, I'm not coming. I can't, <laughs> I can't watch that. I can't watch that. I said, Ben, it's just acting. So, I mean, things like that. Like, I, I don't know, like I could take a role where I'm a really horrible person, you know, and murder someone. And then my kids are going to come and watch that. So it's like, you know, I'm trying to get them used to the fact that acting is just acting. It's just pretending it's just playing. Don't get upset. Of, and, and he came and saw it and he was fine, but it was a challenge for him. But you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I would ever do anything that I'd be embarrassed for them to see, but they've been very supportive. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, they've been great. <laughs> I mean, like like we said, it's great when family uh, and other people are supportive of oh, you. Oh, sure. And uh, definitely believe in you. So what what steps did you take to get in get back into acting? I mean, you said that your, your brother helped you get that started. Right. Um, what kind of things did you do to prepare yourself mentally uh I don't know, physically, because yes. I mean, now you're not at a desk, exactly. well, you know, walking around in a, in a school, but you're up and you're moving around and standing for a long period. Well, you had that with teaching, right? but, but still, um, I'm sure there's something that you had to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, one of the most challenging things about acting. Well, first of all, the kind of acting that I do, which is stage performance. And it's, I mean, you have to stay very focused. Um, most shows run between two and two and a half hours. And if you have a large role with a lot of lines to memorize, line memorization is very challenging. And it's challenging. Your, your director gives you goals to meet, to be off book um, by a certain time. Off book means you have that scene memorized. And, you know, you, you want to meet those goals because um, one of the great things about performing on stage is it's like you work as a team with these other people. It's an ensemble cast. You get very close to these people and it just kind of, it's almost like a religious experience for me. It's, you know, it is like every show is different than the audience is reacting to you. So you have this relationship with the audience, even though you're not directly focused on them, you know, there's that fourth wall, you know, you don't want to break the fourth wall and all that. But, um, I, I had some challenges in line memorization when I started to get some roles where I had to, um, so my husband actually for my birthday, um, purchased for me and now I can do this on my iPhone, but I, I do, I do use a little recorder and I, I had to come up with a system of how to memorize, like what was going to work best for me. Cause every actor has a different way of doing it. Some actors actually record their own lines and play it back over and over. So they learn their own lines. What works best for me is I record everybody else's lines and I leave blank air where my line is supposed to go. So I can listen to the show and I can practice like I'm almost rehearsing because I'm hearing all of the other actors. And then I know my line comes in here. That helps me to remember the cues and when I come in. So every, every actor, you know, that that's uh and yeah, I mean, you've got to stay physically well, um, you have to take care of yourself, you know, which I always did anyway, because teaching is very demanding. I think teaching is just as demanding as what I'm doing now. And, you know, it, it pays to stay well and take care of yourself. And, uh, and yeah, so all, all of those things. When you got started, was there any roadblocks that you hit? I, I don't know if I would say roadblocks. I, I think the most challenging part of it is, um, depending on, what you're doing. There are theater situations that are more challenging than others. Every experience I've learned something, but I've been, the show I'm in now, I think is the sixth show that I've done since I retired three years ago. And, um, I've done some community theater work where I feel, and, and not, to, not to say that some, some of the actors have had more challenges as far as kind of getting themselves together on time. And um, now I, the show I'm doing right now is with a professional theater company. So everybody is on board. You know, the director says, okay, we're off book for act one by Tuesday. Everybody's there and off book on Tuesday. There's no farting around, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and that's it. Yeah, um, and so those people are making the effort to be there for each other as actors. And I feel if I'm not well prepared when I'm supposed to be, 
it's not just me. It affects the other actors. If you're not prepared as an actor <clears throat> to run a scene or to rehearse, you're affecting everybody else in that scene with you. And it's frustrated me when I have been prepared and other actors have been prepared and you have a couple of people who are not prepared and it just wastes time, you know, because you, you can't, the show is, doesn't have, um, I, I use the term polish. There are shows I've been in that have had impeccable polish and that's because it's a professional endeavor. Everybody's into it. Everybody's prepared. Everybody's working hard. A few shows I've been in have not had that polish and it's okay. I, I work around it and I'm doing the best I can. Um, but the best situations I've been in have been these professional theaters that I've worked in where everybody's kind of right there. Well, because they want to get paid. Well, that's and true. And asked to back for the next it, show. Exactly, you know. exactly. And you're not going to get cast. And I, this is something we would even tell students when I, uh, when I directed on the high school level because I knew from talking to my brother. It, you can be very, very talented, but if you're difficult to work with, people will not hire you. You will not get cast. If you, have, if you prove yourself to be someone who's not prepared, who takes forever to, to learn their lines, who doesn't show up for practice which a lot of actors are like that too. They want to be actors. They don't want to come to rehearsal. You don't want to come to, <laughs> why are you even doing this if you don't want to come to rehearsal, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you, you deal with that at, at, at different levels and different stages. Yeah. I'm sure. Or, uh, how do you overcome some of those, like if, in those situations where people wouldn't memorize their lines or they don't show up for practice? Yeah. I mean, I, I was in a show actually about a year and a half ago where um, we, we actually, the poor director, and the director was a great director, but there were a few people that were struggling and they actually put little, little, um, I guess, post-it cards around the set to kind of initiate the person to remember the line. I mean, it's a shame when you have to do that for people, but we, uh -huh. had, to, we had to go that far and do that for people. And then um, in that sh same show, we had a few actors who would get together because we had some line drops. We had some people who would just consistently drop lines. So we would say, we would actually say to each other, all right, if she says this, we'll say this. If she drops this line, we'll do this. So you try, but you know, even that is a learning experience because you, you don't know what's going to happen as you get closer and closer to opening a show. And if people aren't well prepared, and, you know, anything can happen on stage. You can be very well prepared and still, I've, I've dropped lines and missed things or said them the way, not the way I wanted to say them or forgotten a line. Even the best prepared people do that. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, but if you're well rehearsed, you, you, you kind of know how to cover that mistake up without the audience being. How, how would, how would you go about doing that? Uh... I mean, it just depends on the situation. Like, say you for you for co you know completely black out on a line, right? I, I you just make something up. Yeah, I actually did that. The last production I was in, um, it was a comedy, and this is comedies are very challenging because audiences you think they're going to laugh in certain places, and the audience on this one particular and every show has a rhythm. Like you're just kind of in a rhythm with the other actors and, okay, I say this, I'm going to say this, you're going to say this, here's the punchline, the audience is going to laugh. Okay, I'm going to say this, you're going to say this, you're going to say this, and the audience is going to laugh. Well, we had a night when the audience laughed at something none of us expected them to laugh at. <laughs> and you have to wait for the audience to stop laughing. And it just broke the rhythm. And I had the next line... And I just blacked on the line because the line didn't come in like this. Right, right. The audience laughed. I had to wait. And then it was like, and I just made something. And the director was like, whatever you said, I can't even remember what it was, but it made sense to me. Like I, I just came out with something similar, but I, I dropped the line, you know? And uh. I mean, you hope that something will happen where, you know, and, and other actors will save you too. That that's, you know, sometimes if somebody drops a line, another actor kind of comes in and saves the day for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it could be a lot of lines to, uh, to memorize. Do you look at the lines in between acts at all or, you know, once you know it, you know it and you really, you really don't have to do that. Now I, I run lines when I'm doing a show. If it's a show, I run lines every day. I never take it for granted. I, I run the lines every day with my recorder, practice it every day, and then the show is at night. Again, some actors 
feel they won't be as fresh with the lines if they do that. And maybe they just go over if they have a couple of monologues. They'll just go over their monologues in their head or something like that. So it it, it depends. They, it, I guess they'll feel like they might be too robotic or something in their answer? Sometimes. You, my brother used to say, he still says as a director, that sometimes you can be over-rehearsed. Um, if, if, you, if everything clicks, in other words, you can kind of peak too soon. So you, you peak like during dress rehearsal and then everybody starts getting kind of stale because, you know, but I'll tell the audience usually takes care of that for you because every audience is different. And when you do it in front of an audience, it's just a lot, it's just magical. So even if you feel like, oh, I'm getting kind of tired of this, then the audience starts coming with you. and Well, you get that energy back. I yes. mean, the same as uh, me with DJing, you know, it's not any fun sitting in a room by myself doing it as much as it is being out in front of, a, even if it's only two people or Absolutely. one other person it's much more exciting especially when they get into it and then you can you feed off of that absolutely with that said is there any parts of your dream that haven't quite worked out i think i'd like to do maybe more singing um because i i did do a lot of singing and um i actually joined i was uh i'm still actually on the executive board of this organization i joined a a choral group um Choral Arts of Southern New Jersey, and um, it, it's a really wonderful choral group, but because of all the acting I'm doing, I haven't been able to commit myself to sing for them. So I think what I'd probably like to do is maybe do a musical at some point, but see, I don't read music. I mean, I can sing, and I can memorize, but um, I, I, I guess I read music more than I probably give myself credit for. I can read a little bit, but... Um, that would be that would be a challenge to kind of be involved in a musical again. So that might be something I'd be interested in doing too. So is that that you would you say that would be your dream for the future is to yeah, get more involved with right with maybe that. do a musical or two get back into that because I really I really enjoyed that. I guess would you go would you try to go for community theater first with that um, or would you try to just jump right in? You know, there's there's a website um, called theateralliance.org. Um, they post a lot of theaters, uh, some community theaters, professional theaters will post, uh, you get on their website and you get into theater jobs and you'll see all of the audition, um, calls for auditions. So what I usually do, but now I'm, I'm committed until the end of October with, uh, Brain Spunk Theater is the theater that I currently am involved in now in Philadelphia. So I'm committed to them until the end of October, but when I have time and I'm looking to do a show, I usually get on Theater Alliance and I take a look and see what's available because you're not you're not really appropriate for every, you know, um yeah, you know, I'm a 52-year-old woman at this point, you know, I'm not going to get cast in a Godspell, okay? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I I see what's available, you know, and if there's if there's something that uh they're looking for someone in my age group, then I would decide, oh, maybe I'll audition for that. You know, see how it goes. I almost auditioned for that the theater in Pittman, the Broadway theater, because they, they do great shows over there. And I was getting ready to audition actually for a comedy. And I ended up auditioning for the Pearl at Old Academy in East Falls. And I, I said to myself, if I don't get cast in this, then I'll but I did get cast in Old Academy. So I, I ended up doing the show there. But there's a lot of great theater around. There's a lot of community theater. There's a lot of professional theater. And I think people are gaining an interest again. Philadelphia is a great theater community. There's a lot of good theater in Philadelphia. Uh, Fringe Arts, uh, they have their own uh, space now uh, for, for Fringe Arts. And they have their own facility. Um, Brain Spunk did a show for Fringe Arts last year at the Walnut Street Theater, Lucinda's Bed, um, for the festival. But now they have their own facility. There's there's a lot of great theater in the city. So people, yeah, Philly's a great city. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, get, we get a lot of people come out and, and, and see the shows, so. So is there any last thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? Um, I, I guess one of the things I would say um, is one of the things I've learned, and it, this kind of just popped into my head a couple of years ago as I was experimenting with different things, and I kind of realized that in order to be really good at something, you have to be engaged in the whole process. You know, I remember about 10 years ago, my son was taking guitar lessons. 
And I got it into my head. I said, you know, I've always wanted to do that. I'm going to learn how to play guitar, right? So I had this image of my, because I always sang, I this image in my head of me, like, playing the guitar and singing. Okay, so I start taking guitar lessons with him, and um, he picked it up right away. He was, like, you know, seven, eight years old. So, yeah, eight-year-old kid just picks <laughs> yeah. up all this stuff, right? <laughs> So I'm learning these chords and I'm practicing and I'm, and I realized, you know, it's like, I'm just not liking this. This is, and I'm left-handed as well. Now my son's also left-handed, but both of us play guitar right-handed. But I don't know if that was the problem or it was just, I, I realized what I was interested in was this image of myself playing guitar. I really didn't want to practice this. I really didn't want to commit myself to it. So this was like a one to two year thing. And then it was like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. But the things that I've enjoyed the entire process with, those are the things, like even when I was a teacher, I mean, I used to, believe it or not, and most teachers will tell you this, I enjoyed grading papers. I enjoyed making up lessons. I enjoyed planning ahead for my students. I used to love like sitting in my classroom and going, okay, what am I going to do next week? Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do, I loved the whole process. And the same thing applies with the acting. I love going to rehearsal. I even love memorizing. It's, it's a bitch, but I love <laughs> memorizing my lines. I love that process. Even in shows where I don't have a lot of lines, a lot of actors, if they're not in certain scenes in a play, They'll like go out of the room, listen to music, walk around, you know, a lot of theaters have monitors so you can see where the show is progressing. So, you know, when you have to be back on stage, when I'm not in a scene, I'm usually behind the curtain listening to the other actors because I just love listening to the show. I love hearing the arc of the show. I love listening to my fellow actors and getting into their scenes and hearing how they're delivering their lines and, oh my God, he delivered that so great. I, I love the whole process. And I think that's the secret to success. If you don't love the whole process, you're probably not going to succeed at it. So if it was anything I would want to share with your <laughs> listeners, that would be it. If you're loving the whole process, you're going to be a success at it. That's I, what I, I that's can't what agree more with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see it every day. I mean, look at like baseball players. You know, right. they, they get good at one thing and then right. they're, they're pigeon held to it. Or, you know, Allen Iverson years ago, yeah, practice, practice. <laughs> practice. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't commit to it, you know, and whatever you say about, I mean, I remember years ago reading an article about Michael Jordan and especially as he was getting older, he was still playing professionally in his thirties. He would show up for practice. He would get to the facility like two hours before everybody else. And he would work out for two hours before practice <laughs> and he would lift weights and work out and then he would do practice with the rest of the team because he was committed you know yeah. and you've you've got to admire somebody who's willing to do you know somebody who wanted to play in his 30s and it's hard you're out there with 20 somethings and young guys and you're trying to keep up with them <laughs> and he would work out and still be there and went the extra mile so that he could keep up with those guys and that that's what makes a legend and the man's a legend you can't take it away yeah from him. definitely yeah well thank you very much for being on the show you're very welcome it was a pleasure the pleasure was all mine <laughs> take care take care thank you for joining us for this episode of the dreamers podcast follow us on twitter at dreamers podcast join us on facebook at facebook.com slash dreamers podcast if you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Dreamers Podcast, please send an email to j at jpar.co. This podcast is copyright 2014 by jpar.co. My name is Al. And I'm Joyce. And we're, we're huge, huge Disneyland, Disneyland fans. fans. In fact, we love the Disneyland Resort so much, we host a podcast dedicated to the happiest place on earth to share that passion with others. That's right. On our show, Tales from the Mouse House Disneyland Podcast, we share current resort news, some tips and tricks we've learned over the years to help make your Disneyland Resort vacation the most magical experience ever. We uncover little-known and often overlooked gems we like to call hidden treasures and even review the attractions and places to eat that make the Disneyland Resort so much fun. And if that wasn't enough, we even share some video episodes to help keep you in that Disney magic state of mind. 
If you're a longtime fan of the Disneyland Resort, or you've just recently discovered the magic, this podcast is for you. You can find Tales from the Mouse House Disneyland Podcast at www.talescast.com and in iTunes. And remember, make, make it, it a, a Mickey, Mickey Day. day.